in health. You know, they, they have people will say, well, this is devastating to me. You know, I, today, for instance, I got a raspy voice, okay? But I see it, the benefit side is that I've, I've got a sexy voice. It's all the way I look at it. And if I can see it in that fashion, I can use it to my advantage. Everyone has setbacks in their life, perceptually. And I think that they can occur in any of the seven primary areas of life. We could have intellectual setbacks. We've, I have a gentleman that had to take a test three times to get his license. That's a setback to some people. Um, we could have a financial setback where we can have uh, the markets go backwards or we thought we were going to be able to save and invest and we had to, we had costs that we were unexpected. These are setbacks. We have business setbacks. We'd have a hope to grow our business and we've had um, things come up that we didn't expect that slowed down our business growth. We've also had relationship setbacks where we've had uh, things were flowing really well and then all of a sudden we hit a we had a real obstacle in our relationship dynamics or possibly a change in relationships. Those can be setbacks or it could be with children. We could have setbacks with some of the children dynamics that we face. We can also have setbacks with our social climbing and our social networking. Um, I've, I've seen people all of a sudden have something happen in their life and all of a sudden people rejected them and shut down on them. And that can be a setback as far as the growth social in social power. We can have physical setbacks, health issues. Um, I've got a, a hoarse voice today, laryngitis. I wouldn't call it a setback so much, but um, I caught my sexy voice. Hopefully that's not too much of a hindrance to you today, but I've had uh, a little bit of a raspy laryngitis this morning. Uh, we can also have an inspirational things where we're not feeling inspired and we're losing our, our clarity of vision. Some people can have that a moment and have setbacks. So you can have a setback in any of seven areas of life. And I'm sure that as people um, would write in on the setbacks they've had, they could fall into one of those categories easily. So I'm going to go around and address each of those. <clears throat> the first thing I'm going to say is that every setback that we face can be altered by three things, our perceptions, our decisions, and our actions. Those are only three things we have control over in life. And so we can change our perception of the event that we call a setback. We can change the decisions of what we decide to do. And then we can change our actions around it. And all three of those we have control over. <clears throat> we may not have control over what has happened, but we have control of our perception, decisions, and actions around it. That's why we're never a victim of history. We're a master of destiny. Once we understand those three things, we have control over. So no matter what happens to you, you have the ability to change how it is in your mind. And uh, in, I, I teach a cor course called The Breakthrough Experience. I've done it 1,071 times. And um, I've seen people come in with that program with all kinds of setbacks. And they have basically been resentful to people. They've had challenges um, almost in any of those areas that I mentioned. And um, one of the things I do is I give them a new set of questions to ask so they become conscious of things they were not conscious of and balance out perceptions that they thought were in the way and turn the same experience into something on the way. And so the first thing, because we have change in perceptions, is that no matter what happens, if we're seeing it as a setback, it's because we're choosing to see the downsides, not the upsides. And I'm not trying to be a positive thinker because you know I'm not a promoter of positive thinking. I'm a promoter of balanced thinking. Because believe it or not, a setback can also be something we're infatuated with. We could have a setback because, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. I had a gentleman who, uh, his girlfriend dumped him. And he was highly infatuated with her, which is part of the reason why she probably dumped him. He didn't, he felt he was the underdog and she felt she was empowered and she felt she could do better than that. And because of her, his infatuation, he felt because she's left him, now his life has ended. I mean, he was very infatuated with her and thought, oh, my God, I can't function anymore. And so he was infatuated and he needed to see the downsides of being with her. And I, I worked with her or him, pardon me, and I stacked up the downsides. So it's not always that you got to find the upsides to what's going on. Sometimes finding the downsides of something that you just think you lost. Remember, I said in in many presentations I've done, 
there are two forms of stress in life. The stress of perceiving that you've lost something that you're seeking or perception, you, perception that you've gained something you're trying to avoid. And so changing your perceptions could be either one of those. If you can find the downsides to the things that you're infatuated with, you can release the stresses and have the setback dissolve. Because all of a sudden, if you're infatuated with somebody and you find the downsides to her, you're no longer infatuated, you're neutral. And then if she leaves you, you're not, you're not burdened anymore. It's not a setback, it's an opportunity. But at the same time, if you're resentful to somebody and um, you're having this event come in your life and you need to see the upsides, otherwise it's running you. So I'm not a, a positive thinker in this case. If you're on a downside and you're perceiving more setbacks and drawbacks or more setbacks than upsides, then you may need to come up with the upsides, the positive. But if you're actually infatuated with somebody, you may need to see the downsides. So dissolving setbacks is not about positive thinking because some of them do need positive thinking, some need negative thinking. So I just want to make a statement that, that going and balancing out the equation is what liberates you. Anything that you're infatuated with occupies space and time in your mind and runs you. And you need the downsides to set you free. And anything you resent that you see the downsides and without the upsides, you need to see the upsides too, to set you free. So it depends on what the setback is. If you've lost something you're infatuated with, you may need to see the downside of the person that you're attached to and the upside of them being gone. At the same time, if you're resentful to somebody, you may need to see the upside of why they're coming around you and the drawback if they were go away. And if you go and take those two sides and balance out the equation, there's nothing there except an event that you're now grateful for. A perfectly balanced mind is a grateful mind. So I'm a firm believer in asking whatever question equilibrates the mind <clears throat> and allows the person to see both sides of the event. So that could be, again, about relationships. It could be money. I've had a person that has lost money and they've had a big setback economically. Um, they, they thought they had paid their taxes and they got hit with a big tax bill, for instance, and all of a sudden they had less money than they thought. And they thought, well, I need to find the benefits of now losing the money or the drawbacks of having that money if I had kept the money and didn't have it taken. If I neutralize that from both sides, I'm now adaptable. Adaptability comes from a balanced mind. You're not adaptable if you're highly infatuated, you fear the loss of it. You're not highly adaptable if you're resentful to something and fear the gain of it. You're in anxiousness and you're in fear. You're only set free when you have a balanced mind. And that's what I do in the Breakthrough Experience. The Demartini Method is designed for that. It's a series of questions that equilibrate the mind, that liberate you from the bondage and baggage of emotions that weigh you down, which we label setbacks, and liberates us so we can be free and resilient and adaptable to whatever's happening. <clears throat> See, we have to go through and we can gain and lose things. And resilience and adaptability is the ability to have something come and go. You know, resilience is occur if you have a perfectly balanced mind and something is gone taken from you if it's a perfect balanced mind you're not feeling a loss but if you're highly infatuated with it and it's taken from you you're you're devastated if you're highly resentful and it comes into your life you're not you're 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 highly stressed but if it's neutral and something comes in your life or goes away from your life you're freed so a perfectly neutral mind is what liberates people from the stresses and the setbacks a setback is nothing but an imbalanced mind so in the breakthrough experience, I had people that have had setbacks, financial setbacks, and I asked them, so, okay, so let's say that your house cost are way more than you expected. They've raised the interest rate. Um, you had more cost on maintenance, more cost on, on having to buy things to fill the house with furniture and all this other stuff. And now you're resenting that and you're feeling you're having a setback because you can't get ahead. You're not saving your money and this kind of thing. So what you can do is go in and find out what's the benefit of having that situation and what would be the drawback of it being the way you fantasize. I always say depression is a comparison of your current reality to a fantasy of, that you're addicted to. And you're thinking that, well, if it was the way I fantasize, life would have been better. And sometimes the setbacks we have in life are not even setbacks. They're comparisons of fantasies that we're addicted to. And as long as we're holding on to a fantasy about how life's supposed to be, then what it is, is gonna be feeling like some sort of setback or challenge. So I'm a firm believer in balancing out the mind, as you know. And I think that uh, 
the quality of your life is based on the quality of the questions you ask. And the most quality questions you can get are the ones that bring balance to the mind. And uh, how are you going to have a balanced physiology without a balanced mind? It's not happening. You know, people say, I, I've got an illness. I've had people with, with illnesses. I had a lady the other day when I was in India that said, I have this illness. She had the symptoms and what might be the benefit of it. And uh, I, well, first I, I said, she said, I have this illness. How do I get rid of it? And I said, what's, what's the benefit you're getting out of it? And she said, well, there's no benefit to my illness. I said, no, there's a benefit to it. No one's going to continue to do something unless there's, there's an upside to it. And we went through and we asked her that question and we got about six or seven answers. It didn't take many where she started to see, well, maybe this is actually helping her get what she wants. She wanted to get out of a job she didn't want to be in and her sickness is giving her a reason not to be in it and giving her time to think about the next step in her life. And she's manifesting the symptoms in order to make that change that she's wanting to do. And so sometimes we think that these are setbacks are actually opportunities. The body is doing something in a way that we didn't uh, see initially. And I'm a firm believer that once we balance out the mind, we're, we, we don't even see a setback. All we see it is an opportunity. We find the hidden order in our apparent chaos, and we're actually now grateful for what happens. And I always say that anything we're not grateful for, somehow we've got a skewed view of. If we balance out our mind, we, we have a lot of gratitude. A perfectly balanced mind is grateful. I've, I've proven that in the breakthrough experience on thousands of people. When I ask them a series of questions in the Demartini method and we balance it, there's nothing but gratitude and love. And they see the hidden order and they don't have a problem. They thought they had a problem. The problem was an imbalanced thinking, imbalanced perception. And by asking the question, what's the upside if you're down? And what's the downside if you're up? It balances it out and liberates you. And then you realize there's nothing there except thank you. So if you're infatuated with something, and if you ask what's the resent the downsides to that thing you're infatuated with, and what will be the upsides of not having it, and balance that, your anxiety about losing it goes down, and the setback of losing it goes down. And if you're resentful to something, and you find the upsides of what you're resenting, and the and the downsides of it was if it was to be gone. Uh, you can balance it out because you realize that no matter what's going on in your life, a master is able to turn whatever's happening into opportunity. And so it's just about the questions. And you change the, the perception of those by asking the right questions because questions help you see unconscious information. And then what happens the second you change your perception, your decisions of what to do with it change and your actions change. And if you have prioritized actions that are inspired, that are according to your highest value, you have the most resilience. I, I, one very, very efficient question, because uh, as I said, the questions you ask in life makes a difference in life. One very powerful question is, how is whatever I'm experiencing right now, how is it helping me fulfill what I value most? How does it help me fulfill what's highest on my value? How does it help me fulfill my mission, my purpose in life, what my inspired vision is? If you ask that question, no matter what's going on, and hold yourself accountable to ask and answer that question. Um, you'd be surprised that you'll see things on the way, not in the way. I, I found that's the most meaningful question you could probably pull out of your head. Is how is whatever I'm experiencing today helping me fulfill my mission? I think that's a great question. And people who don't ask that question, they, they can say, well, how is this, you know, this thing that's happening to me, it sucks. It's I don't want this. But if you ask, how is it helping me? You may not see it at first, but if you hold yourself accountable to look and, and you discover what that is, you realize that this thing that's a setback wasn't a setback. In fact, I don't think there was. When I look back at my life, you know, you can have the wisdom of the ages with the aging process by looking back and finally seeing how things served you. Or you can have the wisdom of the ages without the aging process by looking right now and looking how it serves you. And the only difference is the one you're waiting and running your story and being a victim over a period of time. And the other is asking the question and seeing the blessings and the upsides of that event or the downsides in some event. I had a lovely man in Los Angeles the other day that his, his girlfriend, as I said, left him and he was devastated by it because he was highly infatuated. And I said, well, let's just take for a second. If all of a sudden she had stayed with you, what were the downsides? And, and, she, and he goes, wow, the downsides, if she stayed with us, it distracted me. She was definitely distracting. And I was finding myself doing stuff that I don't normally do to be with her. And it was, I was not getting what I really wanted to get done. I said, what's another downside that if she stay there, if she was there and hadn't left, well, I would have ended up spending a hell of a lot more income. And I just started asking some questions in there and, and asking what would be the downside if she stayed and what was the blessing that she moved on. 
And uh, he says, well, I closed a big deal. The moment she left, I closed this big deal. I said, was that some sort of confirmation that maybe that was, you were just infatuated and blind to the downsides? He goes, you know, I'm, I think you're, you nailed it. And I, and I, I see this very commonly. I, I mean, I, I, this is a very common thing that goes on in, in people's lives. The same thing in health. You know, they, they have people will say, well, this is devastating to me. You know, I, today, for instance, I got a raspy voice, okay? But I see it, the benefit side is that I, I've got a sexy voice. It's all the way I look at it. And if I can see it in that fashion, I can use it to my advantage. <clears throat> and if I ask myself, if I didn't have this voice, what would be the drawback? Well, it allows me to have to focus more attentively on my, my speech, make sure it's clear and articulate. But it's about ask, asking the questions that equilibrate the mind. You cannot have a stress in the equilibrated mind. It takes, because stress is the perception of polarization. When we're living in our highest values and we're more objective and we embrace both challenge and support in our pursuit of what we feel is our purpose in life, we have way more resilience and we don't have setbacks. We're more resilient. We're more, we're flexible. We don't see gains or losses. We live in a world of transformation. And, and I've had people, I, I've had people come up to me and say, well, you know, in the breakthrough experience, I've had, uh, you know, a, a guy that said, you know, my mother left me when I was young. And, and that was a setback because I, I, I was abandoned. And I go, okay. So first of all, um, have you ever counted all the famous celebrities and people that started out that way? He says, no. I said, let's go look online and find out how many people start out as orphans and, and uh, abandoned by their mother. And we came up with this huge list of super celebrity status individuals that start out that way. I said, well, that's in, you're, in, you're in that category. And his therapist had basically had him thinking, well, because he was abandoned, he has certain possible psychological weaknesses that are going to occur in his life because of this. People that have that, here's the stats. And I'm going, that's all bullshit. I said, that doesn't have to be that way. That's just because you chose and people chose to be victims. But what's the benefit of your mother leaving? He goes, well, I don't know. Well, let's look. First of all, what did you think you missed by her, her being gone? What did you think you missed? Well, this and this and this. I said, who provided those things? And all of a sudden he goes, oh, we found three people that provided those three things. And he said, I said, what else did you think is missing? And we found people that are doing that. I said, what's the benefit of those people providing it instead of your mom? And he goes, well, I had, there's more opportunities. And my mom would never give me those opportunities. I said, so are you sure that this thing is a terrible thing that your mom has abandoned you? Or are you sure it's not just a gift and you were set forward and she gave you an opportunity in your life? And he goes, wow, you have a way of asking questions, make me see things differently. I've been sitting there running this story about how I've been abandoned most of my life and I've never stopped and looked at how it served me. I said, well, that's, that's crazy not to see how things are on the way and keep them focused on in the way. And so I basically helped him see that that's just a gift. It's not a, a setback. The setback was a purely a choice of perceptions. And if a person changes their perceptions, they, they, they don't have a setback. Like I said, the, the greatest question as to how specifically is whatever I'm experiencing, whether supportive or challenging, whether things infatuated or resentful, how specifically is it helping me fulfill my mission, my purpose, my highest value, what's most meaningful and inspiring and what I'm dedicated in life? If you ask that question, even the setbacks, you know, I, I had a guy that, um, he had a situation where his house was taken away from him. He wasn't paying his bills and he lost his house and it went into a bankruptcy and he couldn't afford his, his house. He bought the house at the peak. He wasn't able to make the, the payments because he thought he was, he had to lose his house and he was devastated. And I said, I said, so how long you have this house? He said, I've had this for two and a half years and I've been just stressed. I mean, it's been unbelievable stressful paying these bills. I said, is there a part of you that didn't want to, have to pay these bills? And there was, you want out of this, this uh, trap? He said, yeah. Did you get that done? He goes, I did. I said, are you now interested in possibly renting a smaller place and more effective while the market's still ridiculously high? You bought at the peak of the market. Wouldn't it be wiser to just rent it temporarily until the bottom of the market is coming in? He said, yeah. I said, can you see that this so-called setback is actually a gift? You got out of an overpriced system that you would have taken 10 years to get your equity out of. You've now got it structured in such a way that you could go and rent out a place without having to worry about it. You can lower the cost. You can start saving and accumulating some cash flow. You can learn not to get in, enamored in fantasizing about product, buying a house at the peak of the market at, when, you're, when the prices were ridiculously high. And right now you can wait 
patiently and you could come out with a, actually a money making house instead of actually a money losing house. And he goes, you're right. But he says, I, I've affected my credit. I said, well, then get, let's get your credit back in operation. <clears throat> if all of a sudden you're saving money again and you're paying less on your bills and you're getting your, your house in order, you can go get your credit back in order. You're, you're, you gotta realize that the, the banking system, they put you in good credit and bad credit. Doesn't, it's not the end of the world. It's just a banking strategy to make sure that they're getting the most interest out of you. Out of you. you know, it's interesting. People go, you know, oh, I, I want to be able to get a credit card so I can build up credit, which means the bank is not going to give you credit unless they make money out of you. They're not going to give you a good credit rating unless they're making money out of you. And if they show you by giving you credit card bills and they give you a minimum payment and you pay that and they make the most money out of it, they'll give you bigger credit card bills and say, you can now raise your limit because you paid your credit card off. You, you think that's a, a good thing to have all that credit and that's got value, but it's not the end of the world just because a bank gives you a, a, a good standing of credit unless you want to get dependent on a bank. And there's many ways of getting what you want in life without having to go use money from a bank. There's many ways of getting things. I haven't dealt with banks other than money goes in and goes out of the bank and goes into investments for years. So I'm, I'm just saying to don't, don't let something like that be a setback. It could be the greatest thing that ever happened to you it made you savvy about your money, made you uh, not live beyond your means. It made sure that you're saving and investing money instead of just putting it all into a house, which is actually a lifestyle instead of a actual, there's no asset building in that house unless you downgrade somewhere down the line. So it's actually helping you manage money and think about what's really priority in your life. Somehow people think, well, I got to get a house, but that's not necessarily the wisest use of your money. Sometimes why to go put your money into assets? But this is just an example of somebody that takes the, 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 the challenge and sees a setback. It turned out to be a great opportunity for him. And he didn't realize, he, you know, when he got through, and we finally got him into a smaller place and paid rent, <clears throat> and you're saving away money again, he felt at ease. And he says, I feel like I'm not working for a friggin' house and paying off a bank. I said, you're working for yourself again. He says, that's worth everything. I'm, I, I was devastated by the idea of a bankruptcy, but I said, but I, I realize that that's only in the opinions of people in a bank. No one really gives a shit about it, except a bank. And if you're not having to borrow money from a bank, whoop you do. It's not the end of the world. So we turn that setback into an opportunity. And I've had people, like I said, have had uh, setbacks in relationships, setbacks in money, setbacks in health, um, that, that are actually turned into great opportunities if we just ask the right question. And most of the things I said, there's, there's two basic stresses, the stress of losing that which you seek, that's a setback, or having to deal with that which you're trying to avoid. And that's a setback. All the setbacks you're going to face are one of those two things. And those are purely because of an infatuation with something or a resentful to something. And those you have control over. In the breakthrough experience that I teach every week, just about, I have people that are infatuated with things and resentful to things. And we make them ask new sets of questions, balance it out. The emotions of the gain and loss of those things are no longer there. They're back into resilience, adaptable. They're back, back into th seeing things as a, in a grateful manner. And it had nothing to do with anything about what was out there, everything to do with your perception. of it. Now, you can also take different actions because of those perceptions. Now, like I said, this gentleman went out and bought a new uh, or rented a new house instead of bought a house. You buy at the top of the market, you can be very stressful to have a house. You buy at the bottom of the market, it can be very rewarding to buy a house. If you buy, depending on the cycle. But you can actually buy a house and then want to have to move in two years and then at the buy at the top of the market, and then you can't move. You can't move uh, because you, you're going to have a loss of equity and you're going to have to pay the bank information. So buying a house, sometimes your bean counters tell you to buy a house. That's not necessarily the smartest thing to do. You need to run the numbers and really think this through. Make sure it's really in priority to do it. Thank you for joining me for this presentation today. If you found value out of the presentation, please go below and please share your comments. We certainly appreciate that feedback. And be sure to subscribe and hit the notification icons. That way I can bring more content to you and share more to help you maximize your life. I look forward to our next presentation. Thank you so much for joining me.